In their own form of commemoration of the Ranger Bicentennial, Refusing to Forget is publishing periodic blog posts this year. Let's take a look at this one from December 14th, 2020, that kind of looks promising if you look at the title. It's by Dr. Leah Lagrone, Public History Director at Weber State University in Utah. The title? Ranger Violence in Context, Laredo 1910. Finally! Yay! Some context! Let's get into it and get that juicy context. Quoting from the blog post, Those who downplay the history of violence often do so by arguing that we should not place 21st century values on historical characters. Members of the Texas 1836 Project Commission, it's a committee, but okay, utilized this argument several times in the most recent meeting in Austin. The people who want to uphold the ranger myth want to put history into context, arguing that that's just the way it was back then, and it's presentist to assert otherwise. Okay, number one, arguments against presentism are not arguments for violence. Arguing in favor of context doesn't downplay violence. It's simply an argument in favor of you doing your job correctly. Number two, omitting context doesn't make you guilty of presentism necessarily. It just makes you guilty of bad scholarship. Context, which a trained historian and public history professional should know, means depicting an event among the attitudes, circumstances, and the political landscape that surrounded it. And as we've amply demonstrated, refusing to forget places, all the events that might support their argument in a sterile little vacuum, deprived of the vital air of context. Sometimes they outright lie. Leah Legrone continues, quote, but whose perspective does this privilege in the historical narrative? Ethnic Mexicans along the border had often shared stories with their communities and passed down the horrors of generational trauma caused by ranger violence. Let's also understand that even in the 19-teens, many border residents questioned the ranger force and the interests that it served. End quote. Whose perspective does what privilege? Context? Do you mean context? Context privileges no one. Context helps a reader arrive at a conclusion. Omitting context to manipulate that process privileges your argument. Presentism privileges your argument. And public history is what suffers when you do both. Dr. Legrone wants us to understand that even in the 19-teens, border residents questioned the ranger force. Let's see how she demonstrates that to us. Quote, the poem above shows that journalists and readers were aware of ranger violence, even if they approved of the tactics. The very foundation of the Texas Ranger myth is laid upon this knowledge. The public understood that if a Mexican, often described as a bandit, to justify murder by the Texas Rangers, rode into Texas, or often on land they owned, it was more than possible they would, quote, ride not back again. It's amazing how Dr. Legrone squeezed so much out of four lines of rhyme. This poem was published in September 1915 at the height of Texans' fears about a race war declared by the Plan of San Diego, a manifesto calling for the slaughter of Anglo men by Mexican raiders. Men on every side of the Mexican Revolution conflict committed acts of summary justice and that fed the fears of everyone. That's the context. What else does Refusing to Forget offer us in an article they say is about context? Quote, and yes, the same discussions about the purpose of the Texas Rangers and the violence they perpetrated on ethnic Mexicans and Mexican-Americans found its way to the news media over 100 years ago. Let that sink in. Over 100 years ago, media outlets across Texas, such as the Laredo Weekly Times, asked W.H.Y. Why the Texas Rangers? Ms. Legrone asked that we let it sink in that more than 100 years ago, the media was as anti-ranger as she is. She's trying to deny presentism by saying, looky, they felt the same way as I do back in the day. She wants us to let it sink in that more than a century ago, the Laredo paper was asking why, because they were decrying racial violence. So is that true? Well, if we pull back from the selective close-up at the end of the article that she provides us, we find a pretty simple answer. The title of the editorial kind of gives it away. There is some speculation as to why Texas Rangers are ordered, stationed, 
here. The rangers were sent to Laredo seemingly not in response to any particular thing, and there was speculation as to W-H-Y. Not long before, the federal government had agreed to pay to keep the rangers in service because of continuing problems on the border, but it remained at the discretion of the governor when to send them and where. Since things were not particularly violent in the Laredo section of the border, the newspaper literally wondered why the rangers were suddenly deployed to Laredo. It missed the grown wishes to inject imaginary discussions about racial violence into stories that contain none. That is her professional prerogative as a historian. I believe you're smart enough to read the article yourself and decide what the words on the page actually mean. Representing Refusing to Forget, Leah Legrone continues, quote, The majority of the publicity in 1910 came after two Greek men in Navasota were shot for not complying with Texas Ranger orders. These two Greek laborers, who happened to be riding in a buggy after the Navasota police received a complaint about a stolen buggy, failed to comply with an order to halt because they did not understand English. The Texas Rangers, plural, she says, shot them on sight. The outcry was swift and prompted several news outlets to publish stories on the shooting and call on the Texas legislature to disband the Rangers. <sighs> Had Miss Legrone looked past the first, like, two search results that confirmed her biases, she'd have seen that the shooting of the two Greek men in Navasota was grossly misrepresented by the Houston and then the Austin newspapers, who later ran the correct story. The citizens of Navasota were so deeply offended by the erroneous Houston reporting, they gathered en masse, selected leaders, passed a resolution, and then published that resolution officially in the Navasota paper and sent it off to all the other papers who carried the false story. The Greek men, in fact, did speak English. One of them raised his hands when instructed to by the ranger, singular, there was one there, the other refused and went for his gun, and then he was shot. The man who wasn't shot was brought to the jail in Bryan, where the complaint originated. The owner of the buggy identified it and reclaimed his stolen property. So Dr. Legrone's entire telling is inaccurate, and her attempt to use this story as proof of outcry against ranger violence is an abject failure. Quote, as Governor Oscar Colquitt took office in 1910, the government reduced the appropriation for the rangers to the lowest levels in years. Governor Colquitt disbanded one ranger division from Austin in November 1910, cutting the companies from four to three. This is factually incorrect. Governor Colquitt didn't take office till 1911, so he didn't really disband anyone in 1910. Now, the number of ranger companies was reduced from four to three in the fall of 1910, but the number of rangers in each company actually increased. So Texas ended up with two more rangers than before the companies were consolidated. The rangers were actually reduced to two companies by Colquitt after he actually took office in 1911, and he did this because popular opinion was divided about the rangers. The previous governor had sent the rangers to dry Amarillo to deal with bootlegging and local law enforcement and, and local elected officials did not like that. Then he sent them to Galveston to check illegal gambling and met with the same reaction. The feeling from some quarters was that the governor was using the rangers in the same way that Governor E.J. Davis had used the state police during Reconstruction. Far from being full-throated cries against racial violence, Anti-Ranger articles blasted the force as unconstitutional, quoting from Thomas Paine and the Founding Fathers. They opposed the Rangers being a tool of the governor to thwart local authorities. So Colquitt campaigned on smaller government and fewer Rangers, and when he won, he slimmed down the Ranger force. This was not the first time, and it wouldn't be the last time that Texans got mad at the Rangers for how a governor used them. This was not the first time or the last time that Texans would compare the use of the Rangers to tactics used by Edmund J. Davis. This disaster of a blog post tries to finish strong. Quote, so yes, let's put the understanding of violence committed by the Texas Rangers into context. More than a century ago, ethnic Mexicans and their Anglo allies were deeply aware of the reputation of the Texas Rangers. They had to be. Their lives depended on it. 
present critiques of ranger violence are not new. They are more than a century old, and we should not forget that. End quote. Critiques of the Texas Rangers are indeed nothing new, but the historical critiques you presented don't support the claims you make. You provided no context in an article about context. You could make the argument that Mexicans and the media were aware in 1910 of a violent ranger reputation. You could make that argument with articles that actually say that, but you didn't. Anyway, since the point of this blog post was to demonstrate that even 100 years ago, the press in Laredo was speaking out against ranger violence, we got to know, how did Laredo react to the news that the ranger force had been dramatically trimmed down? Remember, Ms. Legrone tells us to let it sink in that more than 100 years ago, the media was as anti-ranger as she is. The February 8, 1911 issue of the Laredo Times Approach the Ranger reduction in just this way. Quote, The Texas Rangers have been famed in song and story, and they've done valiant service for the state and the protection of lives and property. He has been a wonderfully spectacular character, and his name will be recorded for all time to come in the history of the earlier stages of Texas development. But no more shall be seen the sturdy men in fatigue dress riding boldly through sections infested with Indians and outlaws. Because the Indians and outlaws have disappeared, and the rangers follow as a logical consequence, follow them into oblivion, just as they followed them in real life in the old days in Texas. Let that sink in. <laughs> 